And my name is Mark Benaka. I'm a cardiologist and a vascular medicine doctor. I'm the director of vascular research at the University of Colorado. And I also am part of the American Heart Association Peripheral Vascular Disease Strategically Focused Research Network as a center director of the Brigham and Women's at Dartmouth Center. And, and I mention that because the trial Voyager PED is really uh, aligned with the focus of that strategically focused research network and part of my support comes from the grant. So I wanna thank the AHA. Voyager PAD is uh, a unique trial in that it studies a very specific population at a very vulnerable time point. The trial was designed to understand how to best reduce the risk of adverse limb and cardiovascular outcomes in patients with lower extremity PAD after intervention. Although this group is at extremely high risk, both early and late after intervention, there are no proven antithrombotics therapies to reduce this risk after intervention. And the, the therapies that have been studied, uh, DAP with clopidogrel and the CASPER trial or warfarin, have each been associated with uh, very high rates of bleeding, including uh, an increased risk with warfarin hemorrhagic stroke. Voyager PAD was designed to address this gap. It was a large multinational placebo-controlled trial with 6,500 patients. Patients, all they needed to have to come in was lower extremity PAD by symptoms and imaging uh, and ABI and need an intervention. There were no further enrichment for cardiovascular or limb risk, so it was a very generalizable population. And then patients were treated with best background therapy, including aspirin in all patients. And clopidogrel could also be used for up to six months. So it was standard of care. And then on top of that, randomized to rivaroxaban 2.5 milligrams twice daily or placebo and followed for a median of 28 months. Now the trial was designed with a very unique primary outcome that was really meant to understand the spectrum of risk faced by this population in, in this setting. It was a composite of acute limb ischemia, major amputation of vascular cause, myocardial infarction, ischemic stroke, or cardiovascular death. There were also a number of secondary outcomes, including the need for an unplanned index limb revascularization, something that's really important in this setting and for this population as well as the secondary outcome that included all-cause mortality and the other components of the primary endpoint, sort of the event-free survival, if you will. The primary safety outcome was Timmy major bleeding that was specifically chosen because of the interventional setting, uh, where there's often a lot of background bleeding, but in addition, uh, bleeding according to the ISTH and BARC scales was also measured and all events were adjudicated at the CPC uh, uh, Clinical Events Committee. So overall in the trial, the event rate for patients randomized to standard of care, which is aspirin, which, which everybody got, 80% got statins, ACE and ARB, and 50% got clopidogrel, the event rate was about 20% at three years. That means one in five patients had at least one of the primary outcomes events, which is a very high event rate. The risk was particularly high in the first year, but continued to increase over time. Then the randomization to rivaroxaban, those that were randomized, the curve separated early. There was apparent separation at three months. There was a significant uh, benefit by six months. This continued to increase over time, and overall, the trial was positive. The hazard ratio of 0.85 with a p-value of 0.009. So the trial met its primary outcome and was positive. And to put that relative risk reduction into context, it's such a high-risk population that even at one year, the absolute risk reduction was 2% or a number needed to treat a 50. At three years, the uh, absolute risk reduction was 2.6% for a number needed to treat of 39 in the overall population. In terms of the components of the primary outcome, 
There was consistency amongst all of them. The most frequent adverse event was acute limb ischemia, which I think is the truth for this population and setting. And there was a robust reduction with rivaroxaban. There was consistency for the other components. With the exception of cardiovascular death, we did not see a benefit. The secondary outcomes, the first five of them, were all significant uh, in terms of their reductions, including the need for an unplanned index limb revascularization, as well as when we add all-cause mortality to the primary outcome as event-free survival. Now, uh, rivaroxaban, in terms of safety, did increase bleeding. Rates of TIMI major bleeding were, were higher numerically. The hazard ratio was at 1.43. The p-value is 1.06, um, but we are cautious in the interpretation because there, there were a, a low number of events, uh, so the, the hazard ratio is about 1.4. Um, the most feared components of bleeding, uh, intracranial hemorrhage and fatal bleeding, uh, there was no pattern for excess. In fact, they were numerically lower with rivaroxaban. And when we look at more sensitive bleeding scales like ISTH, we see the same thing we saw with Timmy Major, there's a hazard ratio of about 1.4, and, uh, and then it is statistically significant for ISTH Major. The excess in bleeding with Timmy Major bleeding is about 0.8%, or about a quarter percent per year. So when we put these data together, in the overall population adopting this strategy on top of the standard of care, uh, adding rivaroxaban uh, to aspirin after intervention, we see that we prevent uh, for 10,000 patients treated for one year, we prevent 181 primary outcome events versus causing 29 TIMI major bleeds, but no excess in intracranial hemorrhage or fatal bleeding. So about a six-fold uh, benefit versus risk ratio.